All right, uh, we are in Mark 5, actually starting in verse 21. But you know, recall that we started out in, uh, well, we, in, last week we talked about the demon-possessed man. Backing that, that up even further, we were back in Mark 3, and we talked about the uh, Markin sandwich. You remember that, that terminology, the Markin sandwich? And so... Several times Mark, through Mark, Mark, you know, Mark, or I've heard it both, but uh, the last I listened to it, which was two days ago, um, it was very specifically Markin, so M A R K A N. But thank you for asking because I was saying Marconian, but I think the the Mike Winger was was very specifically saying Markin sandwich, and that's where I'm getting this. So. But it would mean the same thing. It's from Mark, and it's a sandwich. So, <laughs> um, and so it's obviously where one story has started. Another one interrupts it very, almost rudely. And then the first story is continued at, at the end. So you got a Marconian sandwich. You got two slices of bread and the meat in the middle. So we're going to... Let's look for that tonight as we talk about it, because it, this is a very clear example of a Mar Markin or Marconian sandwich. So we'll, we'll, we'll go there. Um, if uh, Doug, if you would read 21 to 24. Okay. Now, when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great ga crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Okay. So he was, he was coming back from where? The city Decapolis? crossed again. Sorry, the Decapolis. Uh, yes, from the Decapolis area, the country of the Gerasenes or the Gadarenes, depending on your um, your version of, of Bible. And so he's just coming back from that. And in fact, uh, this morning I went back and looked. I was trying to figure out what day it might have been, because it all appears that. Jesus left Capernaum, went over to the country of the Gadarenes, and then back, maybe in one day. I didn't, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to see, but there was certainly a storm there and uh, a storm on the way. So was that overnight? I, I don't know. And then he comes back and all this stuff is about to happen. So it was a busy day, if not two days or so, because he, he didn't sleep in in um, the country of the Gadarenes, didn't appear to sleep there. So if there was sleep, it was on the boat, you know. Um, so we'll pause here, and we're going to talk about the country of the <coughs> Gadarenes uh, from a poem from Dad in 1995. He was so moved, and I'll show you how big the poem is. So that's how many little little verses are. So, Dad, would you would you uh, enchant us with your poem? Enchant. <laughs> yeah. You have to have to read between the lines in a place or two. But <clears throat> it goes thusly: Where is he going? The crowd would ask as he turned and walked away. He had just taught the people there how they should live each day. His words were linger in their minds as they pondered what he spoke. Who is this man that speaks with power and wears a royal cloak? He's entered a boat, someone exclaimed. Let's follow and learn some more. The lake is calm and peaceful here. We'll just stay close to the shore. But those who watched were all amazed. Doesn't this teacher know? 
He's crossing the lake in his little ship to a place we dare not go. Demons dwell on the other side, and no one ventures there. Those who dare to cross the lake must face the prince of the air. They didn't know the man whom they were watching cross the lake was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who would die for our life's sake. Legions of demons on the other side were always on the prowl. They saw the ship that held our Lord, and they began to howl. The demons shrieked, and lightning filled the air with thunderclaps. Disciples fainted in their fear, but Jesus took a nap. The watching crowd was horrified as the tiny ship was tossed. The lake would surely swallow all, and their teacher would be lost. Then he awoke and stretched his arms, spoke softly to the sea. The demons gasped because the lake was calm as it could be. Their power suspended, overcome, they'd rather not be seen, for Jesus Christ had just arrived in the land of the Gadarene. Before our mighty Lord that day, the demon's strength was pale. When Jesus spoke, even they knew hell could not prevail. Hmm. That's a knuckle bump right there. It's very <laughs> nice. Very nice. Very good. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Knuckle bumps all around. Good. I like that. That was good. That, that was very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I kind of like to do poetry, although it's been a long time since I've written one, but it's coming from the country of the Garcines. The crowd's already gathering. So so we see this boat coming, and so it's obvious. He's coming back and the crowd's already, hey, he's coming, he's coming back, come over here, you know, come over by the shore. And um, and Jairus, what, do you remember when we talked in um, lesson, in Mark 1, and we talked about the, the, the whole list of, of officials inside the synagogue? Well, Jairus is one of these officials, and he is the ruler of the synagogue, which is the guy who would plan the service. And so when a rabbi was in the area and available, he would be the ruler of the synagogue uh, that, that would authorize or and organize that speech. So he was well known, and it was an official position in the synagogue. Well, if you remember just a few chapters back, uh, when... Um, uh, Jesus had done a miracle. I think it was when uh, Jesus healed the, hand, the man's hand inside the temple. Remember that? Not temple, the synagogue, because that was kind of a setup. And what did the Pharisees do at that point? They used that against him because he did it on the Sabbath. They did, went, went against him, and they specifically plotted against him with who? Do you recall? starts with an H. It's the... Herod? Well, close. Herodians. Remember, those are the Jews that were really friendly with the, the, the household of Herod. And, um, and the Pharisees normally didn't get along with the Herodians. However, we hate Jesus. We want him dead. And they got to be buddies with the Herodians. And so, so the officials, the officials from uh, Jerusalem, uh, all the Pharisees, they want Jesus dead. And you got Jairus, think about this, an official employee, um, associate pastor, so to speak. Um, and he's coming in and he's bowing down before the guy they want to kill. That's huge, that's huge. But when you think about your children and your child is dying, what would you not do? Uh, but Jairus had obviously heard enough to be enough convinced that this is my only chance. I'm going to this guy. He's here, and I'm, I'm going to this guy. Uh, and he had enough belief, enough faith to bow down before him. Think about what it would take for you in our culture or in their culture to bow down before somebody. 
that's huge. That's huge. I mean, and if you're begging for your life, if for your child's life, that's about the, the only thing. That well, and, and especially with him being, being one of the, like you said, the associate pastor, one of the priests. Hmm. Okay. I mean, scripture says that we bow down before no one but our God. Hmm. Right. So for them to take a leap of faith, and believe that he is who he is after everything they put him through. Yeah. That's saying a lot. Saying a lot. You betcha. Yep. All right. Um, Andrew, would you read 25 and 26? We are, I'm going to let you open up the first part of the sandwich, sir. All right. Yeah. <laughs> bread, bread time. Bread time. Yep. Uh, and a large, nope, that's the last part of 24. Here we go, 25. <laughs> now, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. All right. Now, I said the first part of the sandwich. Actually, this wasn't bread. This is this starts the meat, sorry. The, oh, the okay. bread was about Jairus. Jairus, oh. sorry about that. So you got the meat. Uh, All right. You should be really proud. Uh, <laughs> you know, we don't have a name on this lady. We don't have an age, but she has suffered for how many years? 12 years. 12 years at the hands of doctors who were practicing medicine and practicing medicine and practicing medicine and just using her as a test tube. Um, over and over again, taking her money and yet still failing. And, you know, we look at that, and, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about it until this lesson, but the commentators really brought out that the poor girl had um, not been able to go to worship in the synagogue, hadn't been able to be around people. Because in Leviticus 15, it specifically lays out when the lady is, is on their cycle, she, she's unclean, period. So anybody that would touch her would be spiritual and would be certainly, sorry, ceremonially unclean. Um, and so therefore, for 12 years, we don't know how old she was, but she was unable to marry, you know, and not even come close. And knowing the cultural norms, Mike Winger brought this out, that knowing the cultural norms of the time, that it's likely that people thought, since she had this problem, that she had done something wrong. You know, that was the concept. Well, who, you know, Jesus was asked when somebody was blind, who sinned, him or his parents? And uh, that was just the concept. And it's, honestly, it's a lot of people kind of have that same kind of mentality now. So if somebody's ill, well, some, they might have sinned, but or they might not have. It's not really related. Um, but it, it, so she was obviously, she was looked down upon. She was shunned. She would, you know, people would stay away from her. And um, so it was just a bad, bad situation for her. All right. Dad, would you read 27 through 30? When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? She decided to risk everything, <clears throat> absolutely everything. She had nothing left. She had no money left. This healer is walking through. She's throwing everything, caution to the wind. And uh, she obviously had to touch other people. The crowd was was tight. She had to touch other people in getting there. So she technically, ceremonially made a number of people unclean and trying to get to Jesus to get clean. Um, so she's had she's had a tough life. 
a very tough life for the last 12 years. Um, now you think about Jesus being omniscient and it's kind of hard to think that, well, how could he not know who touched him if he's interested in that? Um, but I think R.C. Sproul brought it out that uh, really well, that Jesus in his human nature was not omniscient. Later, he said he didn't know the day or the hour the Father had sent, uh, set for the consummation of the kingdom. So he had to ask, who touched me? Um, he, so he was in a, a purposefully limited state here while he was walking the earth for our purpose. I mean, number one, so he could empathize with us in every way and have questions. And, and I guess to show us how to be human best, you know, uh, even with um, unknowns in, in life. So I've always wondered that. When did Jesus realize he was going to die on the cross? You know, was it when he started his ministry or was it when he was 21? You know, uh, don't know. But it's interesting. But he was in a I've heard other people say it too. He was in a purposefully limited state while here, while he was God on earth and man on earth. Hard, hard to get our brains around. Uh, but he's curious who in the world uh, touched me because I felt some power go out of me. Uh, Mike Winger brought out that he he felt that power had gone out of him, but and some people will claim that that took everything out of him, but power went out of him, but he wasn't out of power. It wasn't like there was, <laughs> it's a limited amount of power. He just knew something happened, and he was curious to find out. The next question is, why did he care to even find out who touched my garments? Why, why would he care? What do you think? Like somebody touched uh, me. Right. I, right. I, I was reading uh, a commentary mm -hmm. in a blue letter Bible. Yep. And I saw one thing in there that, that I, I, to me, I think explains it. But they say that there's actually three types of faith. There is a passive faith. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which one believes that God can do it. Okay. Then there is an active faith, which believes that God will do it. But then there's an, what they call an activated faith. Okay. Which believes that God will do it now. Hmm. So when she reached out to touch his garments, she truly believed that God would do it then. Mm -hmm. And that activated her faith. And that's why rather than Jesus touching her like he had been doing with so many people all along, mm -hmm. okay, was able to turn around and tell her that it was because of her faith that she was healed. Yeah. It was like she activated her faith at that point. Okay. So list those out again. What were the three? The first one is passive. Passive. Okay. Which means you, you just simply believe that God can do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you have active, mm -hmm. which is you believe God will do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You truly believe he will do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you have activated. Okay. Which means that if I reach out, okay, he will do it now. Okay. Hmm. I like that. Yeah. I like that. I thought, I thought that was pretty neat reading that. Yeah, it is. So, what, um, why didn't Jesus, okay, he, he sensed power had left him. Why didn't Jesus go, oh, we got a mission. Somebody got some healing. Great. I'm pressing on. I got something to do. Why, why did he take the time to turn around and say something? To let her know that her faith was like, what I read, activated. Right. so to speak, because, but it was like he had to respond or he felt he needed to respond 
and let him or let her know that it was because of her faith. And that's there you go. So it it was confirmation of a relationship. Yeah, you know, Jesus wants to know us. He wanted to know the lady that was just healed. And uh, and so yeah, you're right. It was confirmation with the lady. It was but anyway, we need to press on with the lady here. Um uh, Doug, would you read 31 through 33? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. I think it was uh, Mike Winger brought out that um, uh, she was, in fact, a woman. And women were not high in stature, certainly at this time. And um, so it was, he was, in a sense, wanting a relationship with her and, and value her by speaking with her. So that's probably another reason uh, to turn around. Um, 34, Andrew. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. All right. Can you imagine how scared she was? She's a second-rate citizen, slightly above a goat. And uh, she has stopped the teacher from going on an important mission. And he's calling her out. And then he says the word daughter. Can you imagine how she just, oh, it's going to be okay <laughs> now, you know? And uh, I know when, when I call my daughter daughter, it's a very, uh, it, it invokes an emotion in me, you know, or if you call your son, your son. There's an emotion, there's a fam familial feeling there that goes with that, an ownership and a, uh, a love. So when he starts his conversation with daughter, you're going to be okay kind of a thing. You know, that's, your faith has made you well. It's all good. It's all good. So I thought that was kind of neat. So anyway, he has the relationship. He's established a relationship and comforted her and in front of everybody. And now let's start the end of the Marconian sandwich with the, the other piece of bread. Dan, would you read 35 and 36? While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. All right. Poor, poor Jairus, his daughter is dying. He knows his daughter is dying. And this lady stops him by just touching Jesus. <laughs> it's because he's already got Jesus on the path, on the way to the house. We're going, we're on the way. And somebody stops. And Jairus, is, he's got to be just, you know, his blood pressure is through the roof right now. But he witnesses somebody be getting healed. So that's got to bump his faith up. It's going to feel like, okay, this guy's, this guy's for real. I'm feeling better about it. And look at what, uh, you know, somebody said that uh, his daughter's died, but Jesus leans over to him basically and says, hey, chill. It's okay. Just believe. It's all right. We got this. And so, um, uh, Jairus's faith has got to be built higher and higher at this at this point. Um, but how often does Jesus lean over to us and say, when things aren't going so good, hey, just believe it'll be okay. We're good. When Jesus turns around and says, "Who touched me?" Uh, and I mean, having read this, who knows how many times, but the focus is always on on her but then to kind of just kind of step back a little bit and think about the other people in the crowd witnessing this uh 
like how many people did that move you know yeah that's, that's something that's kind of so maybe he turned around just for her but also mm. you know the the ripple effect of what's happening here mm -hmm. probably changed so many hearts yeah yeah, I think about the, the people that were in the crowd who were shuffling around and somebody might have scuffled against him or whatever and thinking, hmm, is he talking to me? Is he is he is he meaning me now? I, what do I say? And then this lady comes up. Oh, yeah, her. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So and that's yeah. Jesus does things for impact, obviously. And this had great impact. This had great impact. So somebody comes up and says, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. She's gone. And Jesus comforts Jairus and uh, says, don't worry about it. Have faith. Believe. 37, just 37, Dan. <laughs> And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Why? Why? So he stops everybody, stops the crowd, just has his three favorite posse go with him. Why? Sometimes you don't want to be with the crowd, Rich. What's that? Sometimes you don't want to be with the crowd. Sometimes you don't want to be with the crowd. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. That's not. That's no, that's well. I mean, that's just Jesus got away by himself a lot. So yeah. And so, well, what we're going to talk about here is going to come out in 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 spades in just a minute. But uh, what I was trying to think, what did he have the the rest of his the nine disciples were going to be left there. Why just take the three? Why take those three? Were they not the three that were with him that wrote? I think you're on to something, Doug. Two of those three were right. The last week, the last week we, we discussed the only ones that were with him mm -hmm. during the time that they wrote about. Mm -hmm. And wasn't that the three? That wasn't the three, but it's close. Peter and John of these three are the only ones that wrote anything. The, this James is not one that wrote. The James that wrote is the one that is uh, Jesus' brother, and, which was not even a believer at this time. In fact, we just saw him basically claim that Jesus was crazy. Right, right. Um, but, uh, I think you're, I think you're onto something there, Doug, that two of those were writers and Jesus is going to tell, you know, I'll tell the end of the story. We've all seen it, that uh, is going to tell, uh, Jairus and his wife not to tell anybody that he raised their daughter from the dead, but Peter and John would be there to record it. I think that's real important. And if the crowd that was there would have followed from Capernaum, they were already fired up about Jesus because he was healing people. And if they were fired up about Jesus, it would have been nearly mob at uh, Jairus' house when he raised somebody from the dead. He would have been made king immediately almost immediately. I mean, it would just been too much too quick because he's got this timetable. Remember, he's got to hit and not be crucified too early and not be crucified too late. It's got to be on Passover at a certain time. So um, he's controlling, you know, he was in the country of the Gadarenes and he told the demonic man, go tell, uh, go tell your friends, go tell everybody. It's okay. He gets back to Capron, don't tell anybody. Don't don't say anything because he's got to control this timing. He's got to control it. So he wants to do the things, but he's got to control it. 
So interesting points, really interesting uh, uh, controlling of, of everything that he's doing. Uh, 38, um, there we go. And whose turn is it? Who did I have read last? Is it Doug? No, I think it's Andrews. Is it Andrew? Andrew hasn't written. Andrew? Seems like Andrew. 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 Seems like Andrew's been left out a little bit. Drew, D, would you read, read 38, please? All right. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion and people wait, weeping and wailing loudly. Okay. These were not um, family members necessarily. Uh, according to R.C. Sproul, it was part of a custom to hire mourners when a family member died. The rabbis would make sure that even if they were dirt poor, they would uh, have to hire at least two flutists and one female whaler. <laughs> this is true. Isn't that interesting? But Jairus likely better off than that. There was a number of people, and we don't know how far it was from where Jesus was at the shore or wherever he was met to Jairus's house, but it was long enough of a journey that the girl died and they had already hired people to come in and start wailing. So I don't know how long that takes. Get on, I don't know, whaler.com or something. Yeah. Contract with some. I don't know how that worked, but there was a little bit of time. You know, was it an hour journey? We don't, we don't know. I don't know. Um, all right, 39 and 40. Doug? All right. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Uh, again, R.C. Sproul brings out that it seems that the hired mourners became the scoffers. And... Uh, so they laughed at him, and guess what? They're going to laugh at us on occasion. That's just the way it, the way it is. Um, Jesus, well, be like, huh? Like saying that those professional mourners and everything had no faith either. True. True. Uh, Jairus's wife had to have known where Jairus had gone. Had to have. Hey, I'm going to go get the guy who's been healing people. And uh, so she probably wasn't making fun of him. But you're right. It was probably the mourners. So look at what Jesus' term for death has changed, has changed to. Um, it, since the time that Jairus talked to him, he took ownership of the situation. And uh, so he owned what was going on, and he knew what was going to go on. Uh, at least he had that, that sense, but he called it sleeping. And uh, critics claim that the girl was, and critics today, like, you know, critics of the Bible claim that, uh, uh, well, Jesus admitted she was just, she was just sleeping. And, um, but, you know, if we look at the other instance, which happens, I believe, later in this time in John 11, where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, um, he said the same thing. Uh, he says, um, you know, when, when the disciples didn't get it, because they said something to the effect of um, uh, Lazarus has fallen asleep. And when they didn't get it, he had to get blunt with his disciples, telling them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Was, oh, okay, I get it, you know. Um, 
But clearly from these two instances where Jesus did this, but clearly if you are under Christ's authority and if the Lord delays, then we merely sleep in Christ. And so it, it changes the terminology, and we'll talk about this at the wrap-up, but it changes the terminology for a Christian. It changes the terminology when we talk about somebody who is no longer breathing. They are asleep in Christ is truly what the situation is. Paul picks up on that, and we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. But that was really a pretty powerful, pretty powerful, because that. It was not not a term that was used prior to Jesus doing these things, not at all. Uh, forty one, Dad, would you read forty one, please, sir? I know you're just going around and around and around, aren't you? <laughs> then he took the child by the hand and said to her, "Talitha kumai," which is translated, "Little girl, I say to you, arise." Um. So this is the second time in a short amount of time Jesus would have been, by law, defiled uh, by the woman who was bleeding because he touched, she touched him, and now by the corpse of the girl. But he is above that situation. He's above being ceremonially unclean. 42 through 43 will finish us up. Doug, and I know it's your turn, Doug. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Okay. There again, he's around Capernaum. He's around people who would take over the situation don't tell anybody don't tell but we got a couple of scribes here they're going to be able to write all this down that's he knew he knew that uh, all right so good good story good um uh, marconian sandwich and it it really makes us i mean it's it all works together so the Marcon. No, i said marconia didn't I? Mark and sandwich takeaways in this lesson, all right? Both of the stories show humility. Uh, both of the stories about the ladies or the, the people involved asking Jesus for something show humility and faith, first of all, first and foremost, from the lady and from Jairus. Uh, Jesus heals the body when the doctors had failed. Jesus has power over death. Uh, the, which is the heart of the gospel message. What do, why, why do we follow Jesus? Well, to, to overcome death so that we only sleep. Um, both stories dealt with females. Jesus raised the value of women, check this out, to be equal in, to the value of, of, uh, of men. If you look at uh, Mary and Martha, where, you know, uh, Jesus came to uh, came to him and uh, Mary sat at Jesus feet and Martha was running around and, and getting stuff ready in the kitchen and and Martha was complaining about Mary and and uh, Jesus affirmed Mary for doing what was most important. That's not a woman's job to learn to be a disciple but Jesus affirmed it not culturally at that time is what i mean so uh he raised the level the 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 honorable equalism if you want to get don't get feminist on me but i mean jesus <laughs> jesus raised the 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 level of the female uh to be he took all this time uh with uh, with women uh, Jesus changed our perspective of death when he spoke of Lazarus and uh, this little girl as merely sleeping. And so for those who are in Christ, we now sleep in Christ. And this sleep is a very temporary condition. Somebody else picked up on this concept too, on this sleep. So if we look at Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, I'm sorry, 15, 51 
He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Again, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, but we do not want uh, you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. So he picked up on this whole sleep in Christ thing. This is death as, was, as it was known is no longer that way for believers. Uh, finally, Jesus claimed Jairus had bad news um, let's see, Jesus calmed Jairus when bad news came. So in the same way, when bad news comes, trust and believe in Christ. And bad news does come. I know it's hard to believe, guys, but bad news does come. Mm -hmm. Right, Dad? Right. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting. If you guys could help me out with this, and we'll end. Um if you noticed when you were when we were reading the Marconian sandwich and the meat and um, and this and the and the bread, how old was the girl who died? I was just going to get to that. Yes, the lady had bled for twelve years and the girl was twelve years old. Yes. What does that mean? Okay, go ahead. Biblically. Uh, you know the the new uh, biblical new numericals or whatever. Okay. okay, and what I was looking at is said that basically it wouldn't be twelve because twelve is government governmental perfection. Yeah, but one and two put together. Okay, one is new beginnings, okay. and two is witnessing. So if you put the one and the two together, both of these people had new beginnings and they both witnessed the works of Christ. What is the one, did you say? New beginnings. New beginnings. Unity, new beginnings. Yeah, okay, I'm familiar with it with unity. Huh. It's a possibility. And two is union. Division and witnessing. Witness, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Or could be. Well, yeah. That's as good as I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> it's all I got for you. <laughs> yeah, it just, it just seems too obvious. It's a 12 there for some reason. And that's. That's the best I've heard, so <clears throat> we'll go for that. <laughs> <laughs>